Hi and a very good evening to all of you. Welcome to Adana 24/7 English Medium. This is Arushi over here, and today we will be discussing, obviously, today's current affairs. But today the Hindu edition was not released. You all must be aware about that, right? So, but still, we have news from Press Information Bureau. Sunday edition, that is Sunday, all press release of the Press Information Bureau, and the Sunday newspaper of the Hindu. We will be covering today. so stay tuned and let us begin with the news of 15th of january 2023 yesterday was the indian armed forces day the indian armed forces day was celebrated yesterday you can have a glimpse of this dt news video on the indian armed force day it was uh, basically the event the event is usually held daily uh, every year in the on date 15th of january the indian army day is celebrated on karyappa parade ground new delhi this year it was held in the city of bangalore MEG center in bangalore the indian army day was celebrated in order to gain more traction in order to gain more attention that okay this year we are moving away from the national capital region and we are celebrating the indian armed forces day in the bangalore city so that happens to be a very big deal and why one reason that you need to know that why is the indian armed force day let us Why is the Indian Armed Forces Day celebrated only on fifteenth of January? See, the Indian Army. The Indian Army was established by the British on first of April, eighteen ninety-five. Note down this date. Note down this date that the Indian Army was founded by the British Indian government on first of April. 1895 but why do we celebrate it on 15th of january is the reason because marshal field marshal kadendra m karyappa he was sworn in as the commander in chief of the free independent india the first indian to hold this position after the last british official who was there general francis butcher he left the position of commander in chief and it was handed over to uh, kodanendra kodendra m Karyappa, K M Karyappa. So K M Karyappa, very very interesting fact about uh, Mr K M Karyappa, late K M Karyappa ji is that number one, number one, the slogan Jai Hind. We always uh, you see I P S officers, you see the Indian Armed Forces people, they they are talking to each other. They sign off as Jai Hind, right? The Jai Hind slogan was first found by uh, General Karyappa only. So Jai Hind means victory to our nation, victory to India, victory to Hind. Number one and number two, second most important fact is, Mr. Karyappa happens to be the only, only two Indian Army officers. They hold the five star rank of field marshal. Only two Indian Army officers hold the five star rank of field marshal. One is Field Marshal Karyappa, and the second armed officer is Field Marshal. Sam Manikshaw. You all must have heard about him. So Army Day is celebrated every year on fifteenth of January to honor the commitment of the Indian Armed Forces to the nation, to celebrate the brotherhood, to celebrate their selfless service and their sacrifice. And this year, away from the national capital region, the Indian Army Day was celebrated on M E G and Center in the city of Bangalore. So. another important fact that you should be knowing about the indian army that in 2021 in the year 2021 global fire power index the global fire power index ranked the indian armed forces as the fourth most powerful force <coughs> Uh, ranked the indian armed force as the fourth fourth most powerful force in the indian in in the world in the world actually so you can see top 5 powerful armies of the world and india ranks above france france that is a member that is a member of united nations security council france that is one of the p5 countries india ranks above france to be the fourth 
strongest army of the world. So that is a lot of parameters are considered by the global power index. So remember this point. Remember this point. Another important, another key point is that government arms civilians in the border villages. So <coughs> there is a news related to related to village defense committees. Now the government is thinking, uh, the government in the Jammu and Kashmir, the LG of Jammu and Kashmir, and even the central government of India is thinking to revive the village defense committees or the village uh, development committees that were first initiated in the year 1990s after during the Kargil war. It was again very soon it was disbanded in the year 2000. But the idea behind the village defense committees and the village development committees and the village defense guards uh, they were taken from the battles 1962 India China war 1965 uh, skirmishes 1971 Indo Park walks wars they <clears throat> led to the formation of village defense committee so what happened was in the Doda district of Jammu and Kashmir I hope you all know the Doda district so the Doda district of Jammu and Kashmir the government and the ex servicemen and the able bodied youth in villages uh, they formed the border to guard against the infiltrations of the Pakistani spies Later on, Supreme Court ruled that, okay, these village defense committees, these are not up to the mark. Why? Because, uh, again, it can be misused by the civilians. The Supreme Court ruled out that the state, the state that is a central or a state government, it does not have the authority to hand over arms to civilians and give them the right to kill. And after this ruling, the village development committees and the village development guards were cancelled. They were called off. But now the government is trying to revive them, to rejuvenate them because of increasing rate of infiltrations in the Jammu and Kashmir region. All right. So prompting, basically, you all must have heard about the throws of the Kashmiri pundits. They had to flee the villages because of the there was literally a mass exodus from uh, their hometowns to hometowns and villages to urban settings sometimes outside the state to control that to control that the village development committees they were formed in udampur raisi rajori pooch kathua and samba districts of jammu and kashmir later on dismantled but now the government is thinking so now you can see <coughs> You can definitely look at this image where the women are learning how to fire. Women are learning how to fire power uh, the CRPF camp in Rajori districts. All right. So upcoming next is a very interesting, very uh, important news is about Dr. Didis. So who are these Dr. Didis? Who are they? Uh, alternatively, they are also known as Pashu Sakhis. <coughs> Alternatively, also known as Pashu Sakhis, Dr. Didis form a very important wing of a project commenced under the National Rural Livelihood Mission. A very important project. Good evening, Kiran. How are you? Most welcome to the session. A very important project commenced, conceived under the National Rural Livelihood Mission. Um, it was taken up by Jharkhand. It is funded by the World Bank. So these Pashu Sakhis, these are actually trained, trained women, uh, informally trained women, service care providers or animal care service providers. So this is an initiative of what? This is an initiative of animal care service provider. Animal care service provider wherein the women, wherein the women are trained, the women are trained in a, a, a range of services like uh, deworming the livestock, vaccinating the livestock, ensuring whether the livestock is uh, maintaining, a, is the livestock being maintained in proper hygienic conditions, uh, what are the breeding and the feeding patterns, how is the animal waste being managed, from everything uh, are being taken care of so all you all must have been aware about the Aganwari workers on similar lines are these Pashu Sakhi workers and the project is in fact funded by the World Bank and the World Bank suggests that 50,000 farmers have benefited from the Dr. Didi program and 
Another interesting fact that has come up is that because of the contribution, because of the services provided by these Pashu Sakhis, the mortality rate of goats have come down uh, by 30% and the mortality rate of poultry has come down by 40%. So it is a three level 30 day training program wherein poultry, goats, pigs, as many as 30 Pashu Sakhis have been receiving training from Agriculture Skill Council of India. They have been receiving training from the Agriculture Skill Council of India and they have been going from farm to farm, from uh, one farmer to another farmer, ensuring that the livestock uh, care and hygiene is being updated, is being taken care of on a regular basis. All right. <clears throat> So yesterday, yesterday and day before yesterday, many people celebrated it yesterday, many people celebrated it the day before yesterday, we have the Makar Sankrantri festival. Makar Sankrantri, what do you understand by Makar? Astrologers called Makar as Capricorn. So basically we all know Earth has three important latitudes, that is the Tropic of Cancer, we have Equator and then we have the Tropic of Capricorn and earth rotates around the sun with an axial tilt, right? So because of the axial tilt, the positioning of the sun also changes and when the positioning of the sun changes, it changes uh, during this time of January, the sun is actually traveling or it's changing its position with respect to earth uh, from Tropic of Capricorn through the equator and coming back to the northern hemisphere that is the Tropic of Cancer. Right, so Makar Sankrantri is being celebrated to welcome, to welcome the uh, the sun, to welcome the sun uh, from uh, in the Tropic of Cancer region. Right, so that is why it is known as Makar Sankrantri, and it is celebrated. It, the 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 holy festival of Makar Sankrantri is celebrated across India through many festivals. We have the Hindu festival of Makar Sankrantri. We have the Lori festival. Again, Hindu Sikhs both celebrate these festivals. We have the Pongal festival, also known as Thai Pongal festival, mostly seen in uh, southern parts of the state. Right, uh, you all must have heard it is a very, very popular Thai Pongal festival. We also have the uh, Makar Vilakku festival at Sabari Mara temple. So Lord Ayappa, Lord Ayappa is worshipped for seven good days. Uh, so this Makar Vilakku is again uh, celebrated to welcome the Makar Jyoti, that is the sun traveling to the, traveling back to the topic of Capricorn. So basically what happens is, this is the sun, right? And this is the Earth's orbit. So, <coughs> this is the region. This is the North Pole and this is the South Pole. Why? Because Earth has a certain axial tilt at 66 and a half degree to its orbit, right? So, this is the Northern Hemisphere. When the Northern Hemisphere is basically facing away from the sun, we here in the Northern Hemisphere, the, we experience winters. And when the Earth travels along its orbit, and again when the northern hemisphere faces towards the sun, then the positioning of the sun comes back to Tropic of Cancer. That is the idea. That is the idea behind Makar Sankranti. So why am I telling you it about about it in so much detail? Is because you have saw you saw yesterday's paper on SBI clerk means right. Many people were asking, uh, many people were complaining that the questions were asked in depth. So a little bit in depth, a little bit uh, in detail, a little bit detailed study of the syllabus will. Do do us no harm. Okay, it will only build upon our knowledge. <clears throat> West Bengal government is likely to spend 150 crore on Ganga Sagar Mela, says Minister. Who is the Prime Minister? Who is the, sorry, Chief Minister of West Bengal? You all know Mamta Banerjee, West Bengal. See, Ganga Sagar Mela, what is, first of all, what is Ganga Sagar? Ganga Sagar Beach is the place, is the place where the Holy River, River Ganga enters the Bay of Bengal Sea. Okay, so it is the confluence of River Ganga into the Bay of Bengal in the West Bengal. So it is basically in the Ganga Sagar district, it is the Sagar beach. Okay, and every year during Makar Sankranti, a huge gathering of people uh, can be seen in that region. Uh, there is a huge mela, people take dips in the holy water of River Ganga and... Uh, 
the festival is also seen up it, it is a great opportunity and a very big platform to so many shopkeepers to so many local artisans weavers to showcase their talents showcase that so in order to uh make the most of this festival to economize this festival to help as many people as we can uh, the west bengal government will be spending 150 crore on the festival okay so you all must have if you all have not been to ganga sagar you should at least go there because it is a very very holy beach and uh, basically we have the kapil muni temple as you can see in the in the photo over here right in the picture over here this is the kapil muni temple which is basically worshipped in the ganga sagar during the ganga sagar festival okay so yesterday i was analyzing the sbi clerk mains paper there was a question where is kumbalgarh located you all know the answer it is rajasthan right so we, here also we have the kapil muni uh, temple it can as well be asked in the question it can be asked in the exam where is the kapil muni temple located see indian art and culture happens to be more and more it, it is becoming more and more important as far as the static gk portion is concerned all right neel kurunji uh, sanctuary we have a certain aspect related to the neel what is neel kurunji sanctuary can you see a photo on the screen can you see this blue flowers bluish to purplish hue colored flowers covered the mount covering the mountains have you heard about the nilgiri hills of the west bank of uh, western ghat region nilgiri hills very very popular so the name nilgiri nilgiri hills derive the name nilgiri from these neel kurunji flowers now these neel kurunji flowers as far as these neel kurunji flowers are concerned a very very interesting fact about these flowers is that they bloom only once in 12 years right <clears throat> they bloom only once in 12 years these neel kurunji flowers will bloom only once so they give their name to the nilgiri hills they bloom only once and there has been a long going demand it was tabled in the year 2006 and 16 years down the line there is no substantial measure taken to this regard to form a proper neel kurunji sanctuary in the idukki district even though we also already have the neel kurunji or we also have the kurunji mala sanctuary of kerala it is also there in the idukki district they, they they are actually demanding a proper neel kurunji uh, uh, sanctuary over there so that is why it has been a news not that it is very important but some of the important facts some of the important static gk portion that we should be knowing that is associated with this particular news is number one it is it, it gives its name to the nilgiri hills purplish to blue flowers bloom only once a year right and uh, also there is a kurunji andava temple that is located in tamil nadu dedicated to god lord murugan uh, lord murugan or the tamil god murugan is uh, offered these neel kurunji flowers and in that way through religion also we are protecting these already protected plant species all right and another very very interesting fact that there is a certain tribe in tamil nadu known as the paliyan tribe right we have a tribe in tamil nadu the tribe is known as the paliyan tribe now this tribe uses the blooming period of neel kurunji flowers to determine its own age because these flowers will bloom periodically after 12 years they will use this paliyan tribe of the tamil nadu uh, state will use the blooming period of these flowers to determine their own age good evening uh, robin how are you welcome to the session okay so we also need to understand again let's come back uh, let's go ahead with the next important topic of the day that is l20 so there is there is a meeting labor 20 meeting l20 meeting will be held in jodhpur district of rajasthan in jodhpur district of rajasthan labor 20 that is g20s uh, meeting on employment is termed as labor 20 g20s meeting on employment will be termed as labor 20 international labor organization will be the international agency that will be overlooking yes 
yes it blooms only once in 12 years so it will be look overlooking this l20 meeting ilo talking a little about the static portion of international labor organization talking a li little about the static portion of ilo ilo is uh, basically <coughs> an international organization that was formed much before the united nations it was formed as a part of the league of nations in the year 1919 it was formed as a part of league of nations in the year 1919 then ilo became the first secretariat and the specialized agency of the united nations in the year 1946 one year after the un was established it is headquartered in geneva and recently recently international labor organization it released its report it released its report uh, that uh, global it released its global wage report 2022 a recently released report by the international labor organization is the global wage report 2022 which uh, basically it states that the overall the world there has been a downfall in the wage rate that is a minus two percent negative growth seen across wages all over the world now this is the global reduction of the overall global average wage rate talking about the indian economy what has been the reduction of wages in the indian economy so it is astonishingly very very uh, it, it, you will be surprised to know that even during the lockdown, even during the Russian-Ukraine crisis, Indian wages remained quiet, resilient, showing a growth of only minus 0.2% in the time period of 2019 to 21. The global wage report also goes on to say that because of inflation, there is a certain level of pressure on uh, basically on daily consumption expenditure so that is one aspect so everything all the issues that are related to labor that is related to wages that is uh, again related to supply chain good evening aradhana that is related to supply chain disruptions during covid 19 pandemic and it is also related to the spillovers from the russia ukraine war it is also related to the spillovers from the Russia-Ukraine war. Everything will be discussed in this particular event in Jodhpur. So when the event will take place, I will definitely update you as to what were the proceedings of the event. But recently also G20 meeting took place related to infrastructure. A recent G20 meet was held in Pune related to infrastructure. We will be discussing that in the upcoming slides. Uh, another very important news of the day is Rajasthan happens to become the first state in India to issue its own blindness control policy. So basically, this uh, important policy has been issued under the Nirogi Rajasthan <coughs> This blindness control policy has been issued under the Nirogi Rajasthan campaign. So Rajasthan's chief minister, Mr. Naman, uh, Mr. Ashok Gehlot, Mr. Ashok Gehlot issued the Nirogi Rajasthan campaign. And under this campaign, there is a policy that has been a policy that has been issued to control blindness. And along with the blindness control, the policy or the campaign issues a particular right to sight, a particular right to sight to every citizen, every citizen of the country. Country. So it will ensure blindness control with the objective of the right to life to bring lives of to more than 3 lakh people, 3 lakh people because there is a high rate of prevalence in blindness in the Rajasthan state. One interesting fact I'd like to share about Rajasthan is that the water of Rajasthan is contaminated with uranium. Uranium happens to be a fuel used in nuclear power technologies. I know you all know that, right? Can we somewhere connect that because of unhealthy water, because of the hard water, because of water salinization and the prevalence of uranium in the water of Rajasthan? Is it because of that that there is high prevalence of blindness in the state? Do let me know in the comments below. Do let me know. Here's a food for thought 
for all of you because it's a general awareness session and the title is India and the world. So know about the nation, know about the world, everything in and out. So be generally aware. Uh, be very, very strong with your static GK and banking and financial awareness. We are planning a completely separate session related to that. All right. So we also have the medical and health secretary Prithvi Raj. He also said the state government would mandatory run keratoplasty, keratoplasty centers for cornea transplant. So again, yesterday, yesterday, yesterday we saw that uh, Superceuticals, who all know about superceuticals? Superceuticals are actually pharmaceutical treatments powered by AI. Videsha happens to be the first state in the country to implement the concept of 5G startups. We'll probably discuss that news once again. So again, keratoplasty centers are basically the centers that are used to treat blindness and um, issue cornea transplants. All right. Another important news that is a report by Price Waterhouse Coopers, Price Waterhouse Coopers and Association of Microfinance Institutions of India. Price Waterhouse Coopers happens to be a non-governmental organization in the US, right? And it has released a report that microfinance institutions or the microfinance institutions, they have a lot of scope, they have a lot of scope to uh, offer a financial support system to the low income group or the LIG group in India. They offer a lot of score to scope to offer LIG uh, <laughs> India. Okay. Kadavul. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, Kadavul. Most welcome to the session. All those of you who are new to the session. And if you want to prepare for SBI clerk, IBPS PO mains, and all of these exams, do subscribe to Adda 24-7 English Medium. Right? And uh, we will keep updating you with everything today only the ibps exam calendar was released i hope you all attended the session we will soon be sharing a detailed timetable and a study plan if you are a full-time aspirant if you are a working aspirant if you are a college going student what should be the right strategy for each one of you we will be discussing that good evening nandu most welcome to the session nandu sakshakya and all those of you who are new to the session do subscribe give it a like and share it with as many people as you can who are your colleagues, who are your peers, maybe preparing for gender, uh, 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 maybe preparing for current affairs, right, for SBI. All right, thank you, thank you, Anshika. So, what basically is a microfinance? How does RBI define? If there was a certain benchmark, if there was a certain definition, okay, this category of loan is a microfinance loan and this category of loan is not a microfinance loan. Now, RBI has in its one of the circular, RBI has set a criteria. RBI has set a criteria that a microfinance loan is essentially a loan that is given out to individuals, that is given out to people, that does not exceed. There are two basic criteria noted down. Number one is 3 lakh. The total amount of the loan should not exceed rupees 3 lakh, number one. And number two, second important criteria is there should be no collateral. <laughs> there should be no collateral attached to that microfinance loan. These are the two very basic criteria issued by the Reserve Bank of India. LIC AAO is also out. Yes, we'll, we'll take that up for sure. These are the two criteria. So the loan should be within the limit of rupees 3 lakh lump sum and there shouldn't be any collateral attached to that microfinance loan. Only and only then that will be categorized as a microfinance loan all right suppose suppose there is a loan for say rupees 50000 suppose there is a loan for say rupees 1 lakh but there happens to be a collateral that is attached to it i hope you all understand what is a collateral if you do comment a yes okay so if there is a collateral even for a rupees 50000 loan that will not be categorized as a microfinance loan i hope you it is very very clear as to what is a microfinance loan so mfi industry uh, um, 
PwC or the Price Water Coopers and Association of Microfinance Institute of India, basically it is predicting that MFIs will play a very significant role in India's economic growth. Is basically because MFIs are starting to adopt. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, MFIs are starting to adopt uh, digital infrastructure and digital support in order to ensure that uh, they are adopting a digital uh, route by online delivery channels, by mobile banking, by e-wallets. That they are paving the way for the sector to adopt digitalization to a large scale. Right, so basically, low-income group uh, member, people, individuals, uh, farmers, street vendors, these happen to be the customer base of microfinance institutions. And the, one of the biggest challenge, one of the biggest hurdle that these microfinance institutions face is that the physical mode of loan taking, the physical mode of lending and borrowing, it has become a hurdle. So now it is adopting the digital route. It is taking on with the technological integration to provide services as far as repayment and the collection systems are concerned. Okay, Australia deal could open more doors to Indian pharma firms. Australia, Australia happens to be one of the biggest market for the Indian pharmaceuticals. Why? See, let me tell you one very, very important fact related to it. 55%, uh, 55% of India's pharmaceutical exports, they go to highly regulated markets highly regulated markets of the United States, highly regulated markets of the United Kingdom. So without an approval from the US FDA, that is Federal Drug Association of the United States of America, without the approval of US FDA, no cosmetic product, no medical device, no pharmaceutical, nothing that is even eatable or edible can enter that country. And Indian pharmaceuticals, generic or even patented drugs, they happen to surpass all the licensing uh, criteria and the standards of highly regulated bodies like the US FDA. So Indian pharmaceuticals have kind of a goodwill name all across the world all across the world and 55% go to the highly regulated market. Now, as far as the Australian market is concerned, here Australian deal, when we are talking about the Australian deal, what is that Australian deal? That Australian deal is basically free trade agreement. The free trade into Australia, free that Australian deal is associated with into Australia free trade agreement. All right, so 12% of generic drugs and 18% of the over-the-counter drugs. So total amount, total amounting to at least 14 billion US dollars. Total amounting to rupees, uh, to uh, dollar 14 billion. That is the amount of drugs that we export to Australia, including generic, including over-the-counter, including patented. So Australians, they do not care. They just don't care whether the drug is a generic drug, whether the drug is a patented drug. Even if they have to shell out an extra from the pocket, they will go ahead and do so. They will go ahead and do so. So that is why it is a very strolling market. In 2020-21, India's firms, they export to Australia. India's exports to Australia were worth 387 million. And that is only the pharma exports. You can see 14 billion dollars of total pharmaceutical exports from the Indian economy, of which a significant share of 387 million dollar exports going to Australia in 2020-21. Isn't that significant? Isn't that significant, Anuradha, Robin, Nandu? <coughs> India is also the origin of Ayurveda, yes. And we are globalizing the Ayurveda medicine. We are globalizing the Ayurveda medicine. We also have the World Center for Ayurveda coming up in Gujarat. All these perspectives happen to be very, very... So when you start thinking in that line, when you start, when your thought process completely changes and it is integrated with the happenings in India, with the happenings with the, the world around, when you start think, when you start thinking like a policy maker already, then the facts need not be mugged up. You already know them. Right? You already know them. So that is the beauty of general awareness. It not only makes you knowledgeable,
but it also makes you informed and it also changes the way you think. And my agenda of these sessions is to inculcate that thinking process within your conscious already. So yes, uh, we will discuss in detail about what the Indo-Australian deal is about. American Davis, American qualifier Lauren Davis, she has won her second WTA, that is World Tennis Association title. American qualifier Lauren Davis has won this <coughs> for the second time uh, after a six-year drought. She swept the Italian Elisabetta Cochirato. Cochiarato at the Hobart International Final. Hobart International Stadium is basically a stadium in Australia, right? And the World Trade, a World Tennis Association tournament was taken there. And see, uh, she, the finals were faced between Lauren Davis and Elizabeth Cochiarato. So whenever we are reading and covering the sports news, it is not only important to remember the name of the winner, but it is equally important to know who lost the match. Sometimes they do ask who lost the match or sometimes they ask, there can be a statement based question. So IBPSPO means when you will read general awareness, you will come across most of the statement based questions only, right? Not statement based questions like option one, two, three, four, no. There will be a certain question, they will give you a fact and then they will ask you that, okay, WTA title winner, WTA title winner was Lauren Davis. Whom did she defeat? And then you'll get the options. So Italian player Elisabetta Cochiaretto was defeated in the Hobart International fi uh, Finals in Auckland. And in Auckland also, in Auckland also during the Auckland match that was held in the 2017, also the winner was Lauren Davis. So this is basically her second WTA title. The first WTA title was won by Lauren Davis in the 2017 WTA final that was held in Auckland. Where is Auckland? Let me know in the comments. Where is Auckland? Let me know in the comments. And this is her second title that she is winning. All right. <clears throat> Again, our country has eight Vande Bharat Expresses now. Now let me know in the comments, Anuradha, Robin, Nandu, uh, Kaduwal, whosoever is watching me live, who have traveled the Vande Bharat Express? Who have traveled the train Vande Bharat Express? How was your experience? Let me know in the comments. No limit, absolutely no limit. We will definitely start taking quizzes. We will start taking quizzes on the IBPSPO pattern soon. <coughs> Very nice. It is located in New Zealand. Okay, and this time the WTA finals was held in Hobart International Stadium, Australia. 2017 match when Lauren Davis won. That was there in New Zealand. Okay, and she belongs to which country? She belongs to USA. And the opposition, the final uh, she was battling with was in was a player from the island. All right. So eighth edition of the Vande Bharat Express was introduced from the route of uh, connecting two states, that is Telugu, Telangana, and Andhra Pradesh. Right. Connecting the two states of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, basically connecting Sikandrabad, basically connecting Sikandrabad to Vishakhapatnam. So from Sikandrabad to Vishakhapatnam, who all is from Andhra Pradesh? Who all lives in Andhra Pradesh? Who are all from Telangana? Let me know in the comments. From Sikandrabad to Vishakhapatnam, we already have a Duranto Express running, I guess, a 10 hours long journey. So the Vande Bharat Express will basically reduce the journey time to 8 hours, 14 minutes or so. Vande Bharat Express is concerned. We have Vande Bharat Express now that is there in eight routes. That is there in eight routes, right? We have Varanasi New Delhi route. We have Katra New Delhi. We have Mumbai Gandhi Nagar. We have Delhi Andhra Vande Bharat. We have Delhi. We have Chennai Mysuru. We have Bilaspur Nag Nagpur. We have Howrah New Jalpaiguri. And the eighth one, the latest edition, happens to be Sikandrabad to Vishakhapatnam. All right, so this was some of the static part that you need to know. Now, learning a little bit about the train. What is Vande Bharat, also known as Train 18? It is a very, very important train for our country because it is India's first effort. It is the first effort by India as a country to indigenously manufacture its own semi-high speed train. It is indigenously manufactured 
सेमी हाई स्पीड ट्रेन सेमी हाई स्पीड लोकोमोटिव एंड वॉट इज वॉट इज बेसिकली द स्पीड ऑफ द ट्रेन यू हैव बीन टू न्यू डेली कात्रा वेरी नाइस हाउ इज द एक्सपीरियंस इट ट्रेवल्स एट अ स्पीड ऑफ वन फोर्टी फाइव टू वन सिक्सटी किलोमीटर पर आवर इट ट्रेवल्स एट अ स्पीड ऑफ वन फोर्टी फाइव टू वन सिक्सटी किलोमीटर पर आवर गिविंग एन एयरक्राफ्ट लाइक एक्सपीरियंस टू द पैसेंजर्स अबॉर्ड ओके वेरी नाइस वेरी नाइस सम ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट फीचर्स दैट आर देयर इन द ट्रेन वंदे भारत एक्सप्रेस सम ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फीचर्स दैट वी हैव हेयर इज दैट इट द ट्रेन ट्रेन हैज बेसिकली इट हैज एन इन बिल्ड एंटी ट्रेन कोलिजन सिस्टम it the train has an inbuilt anti train collision system you all must have heard about kavach you all must have heard about kavach who has heard about kavach anti train collision system kisne suna iska naam would you mind if i speed a little bit hints of hindi in the channel because i think it helps us connect more on a deeper level right kavach is an anti train collision system produced by barc ओके बाबा एटॉमिक रिसर्च सेंटर बी ए आर सी एन डी आर डी ओ टूगेदर वी हैव एंटी ट्रेन कोलिजन सिस्टम कवच दैट प्रिवेंट्स द कोलिजन राइट इट इज इक्विप्ड विद इट इज इक्विप्ड विद स्टेट ऑफ द आर्ट सेफ्टी फीचर्स इट हैज सुपीरियर एयरक्राफ्ट लाइक ट्रेवलिंग एक्सपीरियंस इट प्रोटेक्ट्स द पैसेंजर्स फ्रॉम अ अल्ट्रा वायलेट एयर it has an inbuilt ultraviolet air purification system in the train <clears throat> right so we also have these were some of the features and the very first edition do you know kya aapko pata hai the very first edition of vande bharat express or the train 18 express was manufactured at the integrated coach factory at the integrated coach factory at chennai so that is the significance the, the cost of can anyone guess can anyone guess how much amount would had would it have taken to manufacture one vande bharat express can anyone uh, guess the amount and tell me the amount was to rupees 100 crore <coughs> ओके आई थिंक आई डोंट नीड अ पी पी टी चेंज यू नो अनदर इम्पॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट सो वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग द स्टार्टअप टूडे इज बेसिकली द स्टार्टअप इंडिया डे ओके टूडे वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग द स्टार्टअप इंडिया डे एंड अगेन वी ऑल्सो हैव स्टार्टअप इंडिया वीक गोइंग ऑन स्टार्टअप इंडिया वीक सेवन ईयर्स हंड्रेड करोड़ यस सेवन ईयर्स सिंस वी लॉन्च द स्टार्टअप इंडिया प्रोग्राम सो वी हैव अ सेवन डे सीरीज दैट इज गोइंग ऑन अटल इंक्यूबेशन सेंटर्स यू ऑल मस्ट हैव हर्ड अबाउट द अटल इंक्यूबेशन सेंटर्स इट इज अ टू डे मेगा स्टार्टअप इवेंट फिफ्टीन टू सिक्सटीन जनवरी ओके एंड ऑल्सो अ सेवन डे इंडस्ट्री फोकस सीरीज दैट विल फोकस ऑन चैनलाइजिंग द प्राइवेट इन्वेस्टमेंट्स इन टू स्टार्टअप इट विल फोकस ऑन चैनलाइजिंग प्राइवेट इन्वेस्टमेंट्स इन टू स्टार्टअप ओके सो हेयर आर अ फ्यू डिटेल्स दैट यू नीड टू नो फ्रॉम द एग्जाम पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू दैट इज नंबर वन मैजिक वॉट इज मैजिक मैजिक इज मराठवाथा एक्सलरेटर फॉर ग्रोथ एंड इंक्यूबेशन काउंसिल इन औरंगाबाद कैन एनी वन टेल मी कैन एनी वन टेल मी वॉट इज इंक्यूबेशन सेंटर वॉट इज एन इंक्यूबेशन सेंटर एंड इंक्यूबेशन सेंटर इज बेसिकली अ सिस्टम द वर्ड द वेरी वर्ड इंक्यूबेशन Incubation basically means to nurture, to nurture something, to help something grow, right? When you start up with a job, you enter a certain uh, level of probation period, right? There is a certain level of probation period where the organization it will try to see, it will try to look at your work. If they, the organization, if it happens to like you, it will help you grow. it will help it will nurture you it will train you right it will train you so it will that is basically a nurturing process it will be a nurturing event uh, so uh, likewise uh, startups any 
any yes any person who has an idea suppose i have an idea i have a product and i want to uh, get off with my own startup so i will say that okay before taking a full fledged risk let me see how will my startup perform let me see what kind of probable mistakes can i make and because i am a single entrepreneur i need someone to fund me i need someone to support my business idea and that supporter is known as angel investor that supporter is also known as venture capitalist so when we'll study the sebi circular we will see that there are angel investors there are venture capitalists right in a controlled and co environment the startup is given a chance to grow the startup is allowed to make mistakes and learn from it without the fear of any upcoming losses any huge loss so that is what it is associated with nurturing innovations and startup the very name of the program is nurturing innovation at startup at veer mata jija bai technology institute that is there in mumbai and <coughs> wt india champions uh, chairperson wt india champions chairperson is basically an initiative that encourages women entrepreneurs women who might be interested in uh, coming up with their own startups right so we have uh, interaction meeting of women entrepreneurs under the wt india champions and the chairperson of this wt uh, w20 india champions happens to be dr sandhya purecha dr sandhya purecha <laughs> these were some exam related facts another another very exam important exam related fact is ministry of cultural ministry of culture ministry of culture and the government of india has collaborated with spic makai it has collaborated with spic spic makai to <coughs> host a multicultural event so spic is basically spic is basically an international non government organization that was formed in the year 1977 and it aims to promote the world heritage that is the heritage across the world and the heritage that is there in india yes is shark tank is also a program for entrepreneurs for budding startups for unicorns for cheetah for gazelles there are basically three types of startups okay shark tank india is one of them <coughs> so basically all the indian classical dances music folk yoga meditation crafts and other aspects of indian uh, culture will be associated with the movement in 1977 it was started off and music in the park and shruti amrut series will be taken up at nehru vihar in new delhi so there is this music festival going on and whomsoever who is in delhi right now can go ahead and attend the festival okay <coughs> now this this is the news from the press information bureau that we are discussing so the union minister of jitender singh has said that the entire country will be covered by a doppler weather radar network by 2025 doppler red weather radar network will be covered will be covering the entire country by the year 2025 to predict extreme weather events more accurately so uh, the the we have certain district agro meteorological units right we have district agro meteorological units will be installed in as many as 660 district in by 2025 the union minister of earth and sciences also said that the prediction accuracy and prediction accuracy of imd has increased a lot by 40 to 60% so we are definitely moving ahead towards a certain sustainable future we are moving ahead to disaster sustainable effective disaster mitigation right we, as you can see from the last point we have the flash flood guidance in 2021 it was introduced in 2021 and since 2021 till 2022 uh, the number of watersheds so basically river systems and watersheds watershed is basically an area that is flooded by a certain river it can be ganga river it can be brahmaputra it can be any big or small river chambal son anything that is a watershed and suppose it is a cross country watershed right like brahmaputra river it also travels to bangladesh it also enters india from china tibet right so we have watershed basically and uh, 
there has to be certain level of information sharing between two countries if a river is transcending the boundaries of two nations. And the number of information sharing rivers that were covered, they have increased from 30,000 to 1 lakh. And it is not only benefiting the country, but it is also benefiting, benefiting our neighboring countries, our immediate neighbors like Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh. A similar system has also been installed in the country of Sri Lanka. <coughs> Okay, so we also have auto agri automated weather stations that will be dedicated. We also have the Doppler weather, weather radar system, which are uh, actually a very, very accurate weather prediction system, Doppler weather radar systems that will be covered in the state of Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, another important uh, news for the day is G20 infrastructure working group meeting was held in Pune, Maharashtra. <coughs> yes, true. Ganga watershed, uh, Robin, is India's largest watershed. What is Asia's largest watershed? Can you tell me? Can you tell me Asia's largest watershed? <coughs> we also have a, an international body based on that. Based on the, it is based on the names of two rivers. So in Pune, Maharashtra, we have the infrastructure working group. The theme of the infrastructure working group, that is the G20 meet theme, was financing cities of tomorrow, inclusive, resilient and sustainable cities. And it, has, it was co-chaired by India and Australia. It was co-chaired by India and Australia. So it is uh, basically an initiative to ensure resilient infrastructure. It is an initiative to ensure to make cities future ready, to adding a certain level of climate resilient, to adding a certain level, level of disaster resilient infrastructure. All right. So... <coughs> Not Afrikaans, no, no, no. Afrikaans is the uh, language, I think, in South Africa, Pretoria, they speak it. Uh, uh, it is Mekong River, okay? It is, uh, Nile is the largest river of the African continent. I'm talking about the Asian continent. It is, you must have heard about the Ganga Mekong Cooperation. It is a cross-cultural, economic, trade, transport, tourism-related cooperation. Mekong happens to be the largest river that is fed by the three important rivers of China, travels through Asia, flows into the Bay of Bengal. <coughs> okay, so uh, this, was the, uh, this was the G20 meet agenda about, uh, that was held on 13th of January in Pune related to infrastructure development and one of the key components was the domestic outreach or the Jan Bhagidari component of this G20 meet. Okay. We also have the Union uh, Labor and Employment Minister uh, Shri Bhupendra Yadav. He has laid the foundation stone for 100 bedded, uh, bedded ESIC hospitals. What is ESIC? Employee State International Corp uh, Indian Corporation. What is ESIC? Employee State Insurance Corporation. It is basically a statutory corporate body. Employee State Insurance Corporation is a statutory corporate body. It is incorporated under the Employee State Insurance Act of 1948. It was uh, established under the Employee State Insurance Act of 1948, Employee State Insurance Corporation. So basically it is... It implements the ESI scheme, Employee State Insurance Scheme. Okay, and uh, it comes under the Ministry of labor and employment it works under the ministry of labor and employment uh, three agenda are there three agendas are covered one is the medical benefit full medical benefit is given to the employees covered under the ESIC scheme uh, the contribution towards the ESIC the premium contribution is again determined by the ESI Act 1948 that is amended from time to time updated because the government contribution to the insurance premium is updated from time to time okay it also ensures sickness benefit uh, sickness benefit is covered to the extent of 70% of the wages 
we also have the maternity benefit cover we all know about the maternity benefit week it is given for 26 weeks right that is also covered again we also have the disability benefits so uh, recently our honorable prime minister he inaugurated or he laid the foundation stone for 100 bedded isik hospitals in agartala tripura so a related video a video related to that <coughs> I hope you can hear it. <coughs> okay, so this was the last. Cash crops like rubber and tea. The state is also known for its handy crops, particularly hand woven cotton plants, mutta, and tattoo plants. For the benefit of ESI short workers and beneficiaries, the state today is laying down the foundation stone of a modern hospital in Agartala. First hospital would be run by ESIC directly, and it will be the first ESIC hospital in the world. This will be an important step taken by the employees, State Insurance Corporation, towards providing better health facilities to the ESI beneficiaries in the state. The new 100 bedded ESIC hospital will spread over an area of 5 acres in Agartala. The land has been provided free of cost by the government of Tripura for the hospital. The estimated construction cost of this hospital is around 100 crores and it will be completed in two years. The hospital will have all the modern facilities like modular OT, state-of-the-art medical equipment, etc. This hospital in Agartala will cater to and provide medical services to more than 60,000 beneficiaries in the catchment area. The hospital will have both OPD and IBD services. The hospital will play an important role in the Prime Minister's vision for a healthy and prosperous <coughs> India. The foundation stone of this hospital is being laid today by Sri Bhupendra Yadav, Minister of Labour and Employment, Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India. Chief Minister of Tripura, Professor Dr. Manik Sah, is the chief guest for the event. The foundation ceremony is having august presence of Sri Rameshwar Tehli, Minister of State for Labour and Employment, Oil and Natural Gas, Government of India, Kumari Pratima Mohan, Minister of State for Social Justice and Empowerment, Government of India. ESIC also welcomes Sri Pratima Chakravarti, Speaker of Legislative Assembly, and Emily, as well as constituents, Sri Pratima Minister of Department of Labour and Employment, Sri R. Sri Patishi, Chairman Panchayat Samiti Old Agartala. Along with this, ESIC heartily welcomes all the dignitaries and persons present in the Senate. All right. Okay, so this was it for today's current pairs. I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed the session. It is an audio visual mode of learning. I will try to include more and more such videos so that you can get your grasp at static knowledge. Okay, now before ending the session, from this session also only, key takeaway, testing your presence of mind. Let me know in the comments who is the Chief Minister of Tripura, number one. Another second important question is related to Muga Silk. Muga Silk is also known as the golden silk. Muga silk, also known as the golden silk, in which state is this golden silk located? In which state is this golden silk, the Muga silk, is found, is cultivated? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your wonderful presence. Each and every session of mine is made all the more better, all the more beautiful and wonderful with your presence. So keep gracing these sessions with your presence. Keep learning. Keep growing. All the very best. Take care. And do not forget to use my code. My code is Y580. If you use my code Y580 on Ada 24-7 application, any and every competitive exam that you want to prepare for or want to buy the course of, you will get a 78% discount. Thank you so much for watching. Till then, see you in the next class tomorrow, sharp at 5 at the Adda Express. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you, Anuradha. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everyone, for joining me.